Strategically situated at the southern extremity of the Malay Peninsula, midway between India and China, lies the free port of Singapore, one of the most important links in Great Britain's chain of empire, where ships from the seven seas come and go with variegated cargoes, making Singapore one of the busiest and most colorful ports in the world. But behind all this modern activity, there is a primitive side to Singapore, reminding us somewhat of the waterways in ancient China, where manpower takes the place of motor power, and life goes slowly and serenely on its way. Day in and day out, cargoes of hemp, bamboo, rice, and countless other necessities of life are pushed back and forth along this waterway by human beings who render their calloused necks to a service that defies the benefits of modern invention. It is said that Singapore was first settled by Malays about three centuries ago. But as a port of any importance, its history begins in 1819, when the island was ceded by Johor to Great Britain through the instrumentality of Sir Stamford Raffles, whose name is perpetuated in connection with many of the local institutions. The present-day Singapore is a thriving city of more than 600,000 inhabitants most of whom are Chinese, whose residences and places of business form the most colorful districts. Incidentally, the word Singapore is derived from the Sanskrit words, Singa meaning lion and Pura meaning place. And in former times, it was referred to as a city of the lions. Prior to the advent of Sir Stamford Raffles, the island of Singapore belonged to Johor, and it is now joined to that state by a picturesque causeway, which was opened in 1924, and is regarded as one of the engineering achievements of the 20th century. This important causeway also provides a connecting link between Singapore, the Malay states, and Siam, making it possible to travel by railway train from Singapore to Bangkok, a distance of over 1,100 miles. Driving over the causeway into the independent state of Johor, we arrive at the capital city, known as Johor Bahru, with a population of over 20,000 inhabitants, living and looking very much the same as their neighbors across the causeway. In fact, outwardly at least, Johor Bahru to us is merely a continuation of the oriental sections of Singapore. Although the rickshaw is usually associated with the Orient, it is said to be an American invention credited to a Connecticut missionary who found it to be a convenient means of transportation in the more congested areas of China. One of the unique features of the Malay Peninsula is the traffic policeman with wings. We were told that this celestial adornment was designed to save the traffic policeman from overexertion in an extremely warm climate. Generally speaking, Johor Bahru is a quiet and well-ordered little city, abounding in picturesque vistas and colorful settings. The ruling sultan is regarded as a nonconformist, with broad and tolerant viewpoints on the standards of art and living within his progressive little state. The prevailing religion of Johor is Mohammedanism, and the cathedral mosque in which the sultan officiates is regarded as the most impressive of its kind in the Malay Peninsula. The Court of Justice is another example of imposing architecture, as well as a fitting counterpart of the Sultan's good taste in the conception of his state buildings. <music> Out 
Opposite the court of justice, we behold the gateway to the Sultan's palace. And just as we are about to enter, an automobile is driven out by a solitary driver who happens to be the son of the Sultan and heir to the Sultanate of Johor, a most democratic and hospitable young prince who welcomes us with a greeting in perfect English and insists that we enter the palace grounds and make ourselves at home, which we do, and the palace itself is the first object of interest to engage our attention. The Sultan, who is a bit of a humorist, told us that he no longer lives in this palace because he was literally driven out of it by curious tourists who were so intrigued by his world-famous collection of stuffed animals as well as his gold and silver plate that he was obliged to convert the palace into a museum. And here is His Highness, Sultan of the State and Territory of Johor, one of the most interesting personalities in Malaya, who prefers to be known simply as H.H. And now, while H.H. reviews his efficient little army, let us review his colorful career. At an early age, he was sent to Europe to be educated, and his education was by no means limited to scholastic institutions. His wild and extravagant parties are said to have been partly responsible for depleting the treasury of Johor. After his father's death, he returned to his inheritance, which was a broken down state with a gloomy future. But he was an optimist then as he is now. He borrowed a million dollars and started the cultivation of rubber in Johor. The results proved so successful that Johor was eventually restored to its original status. And today, thanks to the praiseworthy efforts of its sultan, it is the foremost state in unfederated Malaya, with an army that is also a credit to the sultan's genius for organization and finance. In his parting words, His Highness reveals a bit of his former self when he says, Give my regards to Jeanette MacDonald and tell her she's still my favorite movie star. And that is the message which we take with us as we say farewell to His Highness, the Sultan of Johor.